I was sitting on a tall examination chair in the doctor's office with my naked foot sticking out, looking completely fine, but hurting. Sometimes it wouldn't hurt. And I would think, oh, okay, let's start running again. I have so missed running. I know I'm one of those weird people who likes, likes to run. And I would see other people running, and I would be jealous. I'd be even bitter. I'd be putting clothes away, and I open my drawer with all my running clothes, and I'm just sad, and I have to close it again. I haven't been running for months. And sometimes my heel wouldn't hurt, and I would think, oh, maybe I could start running again. But then that ghostly, dull pain would sneak back in and remind me that, no, it's just not time. For a long time, I pretended I wasn't hurt. I'm tough. I'd ignore it. I'd make excuses. All the while underneath, I really knew that I was hurt. Finally, I started to tell some people. And the funny thing is, when you tell people about your hurts, they tell you about theirs. And so I got all sorts of advice and, and, and ways that I could be, you know, trying to do something about this. But I finally, I decided, okay, I, I need to go in. I need to see somebody. I need to let them look where I can't. They need to look inside where I can't see with the right tools and the right approach. So I went to the doctor and they x-rayed my foot, which, y'all, have you ever stopped to think about this? They can see your bones, I mean, really, like, how amazing is that? They can see right through it, and they can see your butt. Now, they see what they see, but I have no idea what it looks like. But they're pointing, they're telling me, yep, yep, here it is. And so they send me off to the next doctor. And I go to the next doctor, and there I am sitting in the chair thinking I was foolish for being there. Because, you know, the healing is going to happen eventually, right? My mind was literally playing games with my heart. One moment I was feeling foolish and wimpy for wasting money to go to the doctor for such a little pain. And another moment, I'm blaming my neighborhood. If it's my neighborhood's fault with their darn sidewalk that hurt my foot, and, and then it's back to me again. Oh, no, 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 I've done something wrong. This is all of my fault. Oh, no, God, are you punishing me? Did I not pray enough? I spent too much time running? No, no, it's Brooks. Brooks, the shoemaker. Yeah, they sent me a bad shoe. It is their fault that I'm hurt. All of this is running through my brain, going all the way, and I'm vulnerable, and I'm sitting on there waiting for the doctor, and then my thoughts are interrupted when the doctor said, let's do a sonogram. And inside, I'm pausing and going, this is really comical. I'm a man, and, and I'm not pregnant, and yet I'm about to get a sonogram, and, and so, ooh, my foot is pregnant with pain. And then all of a sudden, whoa, that's really cold. Mamas, <laughs> Respect. Why is that gel so cold? I don't know. Anyway, the doc moves around in this space, and he starts to show me places where there's inflammation, places where the injury was creating more pain, places where the injury was creating more pain. There it was. Now it was time to start healing. You know, my, my foot was hurt. And I struggled to share that with anyone. But today, I want to talk about other kinds of hurts. Hidden under the surface where x-rays and sonograms can't see. Today, I want to talk about when we've been hurt. Not just by people, but people in the church. People who are leaders. People who we respected and expected to take care of us. We're closing out a series where the last several weeks we've talked about doubts and our hopes for healing. We've talked about how doubting does not negate faith. Hear me on that. Doubts do not negate your faith. It, it doesn't disqualify your faith. In many ways, your faith is a journey and not a destination. And so it's not something that you just get to and you finish and you stop. It's happening all along the way. And if we can let it, it's amazing how doubts and questions can actually help us to form a deeper faith. A more formed by reality and truth faith that helps us to get closer to Jesus versus pushing back and pushing away. 
So many times in the gospel, and I read through this, I, we realize that the disciples went through this too. That we're, not, we're not somehow unique. That the disciples experienced this. Jesus was talking with them about how life was not going to suddenly get easier just because they were following him. And this scared some of them. And they asked, what's the point? And in John 6, we read that many of his disciples turned away and no longer accompanied him. And then in verse 67, Jesus asks the 12, he says, do you also want to leave? Thankfully, Peter doubled down on Jesus. He said, no, no, in you we see light and love. We do have days, though, don't we? When doubts really start to sneak in. When it's just hard to believe. When it's hard to see the goodness in light of all of the pain. And for some, it's really difficult to not doubt God when so many of the people who say that they are Christians seem to do so much harm. You know, for some, when, when you think of the church, for some people, all they can think of is the scandals. For some people, when they think about the church, all they can picture is the abuse, the corruption, the hypocrisy, the judgment and narrow-mindedness and hate. I mean, Jesus came full of grace and truth. So why is it that all these Christians are full of hate and lies? Author Brendan Manning once wrote, the greatest single cause of atheism in the world today is Christians who acknowledge Jesus with their lips, walk out the door and deny him by their lifestyle. This is what an unbelieving world simply finds unbelievable. Friends, if you have been confused, hurt, disappointed, disillusioned by a Christian that hasn't lived like Jesus, you're not alone. You're not alone. In fact, Jesus didn't like it when people claimed one thing and then lived something different. In the Gospels, whenever I see Jesus talking with really strong language, there's a part of me that genuinely wrestles with what it must have sounded like. What was it that he was saying, and how did it sound, not just what landed on these pages? I truly believe that Jesus always leads with love, never sought to do any harm, only sought to heal. Now, my wife has done a great job of helping me across the last 24 years of our class, called marriage, um, that it's not always what you say, it's how you say it. So tone matters, right? So I wonder what Jesus' tone was like as he spoke to people about a hypocrisy. Was there anger? Was there disappointment? Was there any compassion? Or was there only frustration? This morning, we're going to read from Matthew 23. And Lord, I ask your forgiveness and your blessing that we receive this as we need to. And all the mystery, may this be a blessing. Jesus said, how terrible it will be for you legal experts and Pharisees. Hypocrites. You give to God a tenth of mint, dill, and cumin, but you forget about the more important matters of the law, justice, peace, and faith. You ought to tithe, but without forgetting about those more important matters. You blind guides. You filter out an ant, but swallow a camel. How terrible it will be for you legal experts and Pharisees, hypocrites, you clean the outside of the cup and plate, but inside they are full of violence and pleasure-seeking. Blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup so that the outside of the cup will be clean too. How terrible it will be for you legal experts and Pharisees, hypocrites. You are like whitewashed tombs. They look beautiful on the outside, but inside they are full of dead bones and all kinds of filth. In the same way, you look righteous to people, but inside you are full of pretense and rebellion. The word of God for the people of God. 
Merriam-Webster's dictionary explains that the word hypocrite ultimately came into English from the Greek word hypokrites, which means an actor or a stage player. The Greek word itself is a compound noun. It, it's made up of two Greek words that literally translate as an interpreter from underneath. That bizarre compound makes more sense when you know that the actors in ancient Greek theater wore large masks to mark which character they were playing, and so they interpreted the story from underneath their masks. Jesus is calling them out, but I truly believe it is with purpose to call them toward healing. He doesn't name them as permanently broken, he says the theatrical play, these characters you are portraying behind these masks, they aren't you. Jesus is naming the places where people, like you and me, hey, today we're not talking about them. This is not a lesson in othering. So Jesus is naming places where people, like you and me, are not being the person that they are created to be where they are stubbornly holding to something of ego, of power, of being right, even when we're not. You know, it's interesting. In Matthew 23, Jesus thunders out these seven woes on the hypocrites, but he concludes this address compassionately, likening his love and longing for them to that of a mother hen for her chicks. Some of you today have been grievously harmed by someone connected to a church. And if you're here today, and if you are listening, I commend you for your bravery. And I thank you for the chance to let Jesus' love win the day. Look, the church is filled with people. We, we joke that the best part of the church is the people. And the worst part of the church is the people. I think we know that. But sometimes we forget. Sometimes people lose sight of that. And some of you have been hurt by someone who claimed to be a Christian. Maybe in their case they really weren't. Because you know what? Attending church, sitting in a chair in the middle of a worship service does not make you a Christian. Following Jesus does. Attending a Bible study does not make you a Christian. Following Jesus does. Even believing in God, believing in the Christ, doesn't make you a Christian. Following Jesus does. And sometimes we find ourselves disappointed or let down or even tragically hurt by those who call themselves Christians because while they have claimed Christ and are maybe even trying to follow Jesus, they haven't yet figured out how to be strong in that commitment. In other words, they give in to temptations. They are deceived. They, they step off the path and they end up hurting others. And look, every single one of us is vulnerable to this. There, there is no anniversary of saying yes to Jesus. There is no number of birthdays where you are exempt. There is no upbringing or, or enough schooling that can completely cure you of mis misguided moments. All of us fall short of the glory of God. So here's the issue. Even though we know we are vulnerable, even though we know that we can fall short, when we do, when we let another down, we blame our circumstances. Come on, you know that's not me. I, I was just tired. I, I was stressed. I was under pressure. You know me. You know I'm not that kind of person. It was just one really bad moment. If I fall short, I blame my circumstances. But when someone else falls short, ooh, we tend to blame their character. They're just a terrible person. 
They're so wrong. They're so selfish, evil. Does this ring a bell? Do, do you see what I'm talking about? Or is your ancient theater mask blocking your view? None of us are without failures. None of us are without sin. And everyone is loved by God. Everyone is loved by God, even, even if they have done something or left something undone. God isn't surprised. God knows that in our free will, we can waver, we can wonder, we can wander off the path and get ourselves in a lot of trouble. In fact, in the Psalms, 103, it offers these words. The Lord is compassionate and merciful, very patient and full of faithful love. God won't always play the judge. He won't be angry forever. He doesn't deal with us according to our sin or repay us according to our wrongdoing. Because as high as heaven is above the earth, that's how large God's faithful love is for those who honor him. As far as east is from the west, that's how far God has removed our sin from us. Like a parent feels compassion for their children, that's how the Lord feels compassion for those who honor him. Because God knows how we're made. God knows how we're made. God remembers. We're just dust. We're just dust. Or as the New Living Translation puts it, we are only dust. You could go through all these different translations and read, but I want to warn you, if you decide you want to use the New American Standard Bible, because it translates it this way, it says, we are but dust. And it's really important that you read it right, because if you say it the wrong way, if you say we are but dust, that'll come out the wrong way. It just will, and, and, and maybe get distracted, and I don't know. Although it does get to the right same place, it humbles us. Because it means something, it means that sometimes we're weak. And sometimes we say the wrong things. And sometimes, unfortunately, we hurt people. Listen, when you find yourself hurt by Christians, maybe your expectations were set too high. Hear me, hear me out on this. Maybe you were expecting a perfect representation of Jesus, and instead you just got a bag of dirt. You know, when people find out that I'm a pastor, there is a sudden shift in the room. When we were building this building, you have never heard such clean mouths on construction workers as when I was in the room. I remember early on there was a site contractor that was apologizing because he let a curse word slip out in front of me. And I told him, look, it's okay. I'm not that fragile. And he said, I know, but you like represent God and stuff. <laughs> that was humbling because you know what? Sometimes I'm just dust. Sometimes I love people. Sometimes I hurt people. And if I've hurt you, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And when I inevitably hurt you, if I disappoint you, if I'm too sarcastic or too businesslike, or I say something you disagree with, or, or I forget a pivotal part of your life, I want you to know that I'm truly sorry. If I lose my temper or become too prideful, or fail to uphold holiness for you to witness and say things like butt dust. Friends, I am sorry. Seriously, though, if you've been hurt in the church in any way, if you have been hurt by Christians, if, if you are just so jaded because of the narrow-minded, judgmental hypocrites inside the church from the bottom of my heart, I apologize. I apologize that we didn't get it right. Because sometimes we just don't. 
In Acts chapter 13, there's a story about Paul and Barnabas. It's a story about how they were getting horribly disappointed. The situation just absolutely turned. They were trying to do the right thing, and then all of a sudden, everyone started ganging up on them. All the church people started ganging up on them, started harassing them, and then finally just throwing them out of the district. They had every reason, I suppose, to give up on this church thing, to call all the faithful hypocrites and just walk away. So they quit, right? No. No, they they saw the offense, but they managed to keep it where it belongs. It's as if they said, the church didn't let me down. A person did. The church didn't betray me. Misguided people did. Jesus didn't let me down. A big old bag of dirt did. In fact, verses 51 and 52 says, Paul and Barnabas shook the dust, shook the dust from their feet and went on to Iconium. Because of the abundant presence of the Holy Spirit in their lives, the disciples were overflowing with happiness. Shook the dust from their feet. I ain't taking anything more from this place. Friends, I want this to be true for you, despite the religious trauma. I want the presence of the Holy Spirit to overflow you with happiness. And if you've been losing faith in Jesus because of people in the church, not to be crass, but but maybe your faith is in people and it should be in Jesus. If you've been doubting God because of what someone else did to you, I just want to say, please, please look to Jesus because he will never let you down. Look at how he lived. Look at how he loved Look at how he confronted hypocrisy. He has absolutely no patience for it. No tolerance for for hypocrisy. But he has unlimited grace and mercy for sinners in need of forgiveness. Here's the thing, though. For some of you, the hurt, the harm... It wasn't just a cruel word. It was not just a disappointing moment. It was a life-altering event. My heart aches for you. I sit with you in righteous anger, and I empathize with your understandable bodily and mental reactions to things that others may just simply allow to just glance across. Meredith Kriz, a licensed professional counselor, a member of this church, was teaching us about religious shame, about sacred wounds, about how trauma can cause normal moments to slip the mind back into old patterns, essentially returning the person to the scene of the shame. Bessel van der Kolk and other researchers are only these last couple of decades begun to discover the realities of trauma the ways that it literally affects the body. The moment isn't just a bad memory, it is a present reality. In his book, The Body Keeps the Score, he said, we have only begun to understand how overwhelming experiences affect our innermost sensations and our relationship to our physical reality, the core of who we are. We have learned that trauma is not just an event that took place sometime in the past. It is also the imprint left by the experience on mind, brain, and body. This imprint has ongoing consequences for how we manage to survive in the present. If you have been living with this, if you have been living with this, I pray you understand that it is okay to get help in processing it. I can only imagine that you could feel naked and vulnerable in the chair, 
processing through all of the thoughts, feeling ashamed and weak that you were there, blaming others, blaming yourself as though you did everything wrong. There may not be an x-ray or a cold sonogram machine to look under the surface, but there are counselors like Meredith and others who believe you, who believe you and want to help you to process want to help you to separate God from the trauma that was ultimately done by humans, flawed bags of dirt, and help you to feel the love of Jesus again. This series is finished, but the subject is not. I want to close with a prayer, but before we do, let me just impress upon you that the God of grace The God of grace does not lead you into trauma. The God of grace does not lead you into pain, into harm. God does not cause the pain, but God does lead you out from it. Does show you where healing can begin, where wholeness can be felt. So please, please reach out for help. Gracious God, this morning we come before you as people who have stumbled, people who have been stumbled on. God, I got no doubt that there is somebody here today who is just reeling from what somebody in the church did to them. And it's not okay. It's not okay. God, we find ourselves sometimes wondering what to do when things get crazy. God, you told a story about Peter walking out on the water to Jesus and and he was doing fine until he got distracted and he looked away and he started to sink and he, he reached out and he cried out, Lord, rescue me. Lord, rescue me. And Jesus immediately reached out and took his hand and said, you man of weak faith, why did you begin to doubt? And when they got in the boat, the waves stopped. God, we need the waves to stop. We need the wind to stop. We need to know that as you are holding our hand, as we cry out, Lord, rescue me. Don't let the doubts get in the way. Examine our lives, Lord. Look under the surface where we can't see. We know that what we have been harmed by, if we're not careful, it can turn into harm to others. As your servant Richard Rohr put it, if we don't transform our pain, we will most assuredly transmit it. God, we don't want to transmit it to others. We don't want to harm others. We know where we've been hurting, and we know that we need healing. And so allow love to do its greatest work in us in the moments of greatest pain. Help us to shake the dust off. Renew our faith, not just in people, but also in you. Give us that overwhelming, overflowing happiness that comes from the abundance of your Holy Spirit in our lives. We ask this, Lord. Cry out. Rescue us, Lord. In the name of Jesus, our Savior, all God's people said, Amen.